You're listening to the Futures Podcast with me, Luke Robert Mason. On this episode, I speak to science writer Ginny Smith. Neuroscience is the only science that has to use the thing it's studying in order to study it. We, we have to use our brains in order to study our brains, and that's kind of a weird thing to think about. Ginny shared her insights into the latest ways to scientifically understand the human brain, the role of hormones and neurotransmitters in memory, sleep, depression, and addiction, and the methods we can use to improve our cognition. You can view a full, unedited video version of this conversation at futurespodcast.net. Now, the human brain is a mysterious organ. The three pounds of grey matter contained in our skull is responsible for so much of our lived experience. From our memories, to our emotions, from the feeling of being in love, to the experience of extreme pain. All of this is thanks to billions of neurons working together with a cocktail of crucial chemicals consisting of hormones and neurotransmitters. In her new book, Overloaded, Ginny Smith takes a deep dive into the latest scientific discoveries that illuminate this intimate relationship between the biological processes in our body and the activity in our brain, ultimately showing us how everything psychological is biological. So Ginny, what blows your mind about the human brain? I think the thing that I still sort of get really amazed by is just the level of complexity that you can get out of what is, as you say, three pounds of jelly. Mm. That if you if you see a brain, if you hold a human brain, it doesn't look all that impressive. But inside there, you've got billions of neurons, as you said, around 72 billion neurons, each of them making hundreds of connections. So you can have hundreds of billions of connections inside your brain. And then there's this extra layer of the chemicals that those neurons use to talk to each other. And it really is just mind-blowing how complex it is. And the fact that scientists are beginning to pick it apart at at sort of more and more detailed levels, I always find so impressive. So so what extent is the human brain responsible for our entire lived experience? That is a great question. It's one of the biggest questions in philosophy, I guess, because you're almost getting sort of outside of, of science and towards philosophy, or at least where they cross over. But I think most scientists would say that our brain creates our experiences. That's not to say that the body isn't important as well. And actually, there's quite an interesting area of sort of what's known as embodied cognition. So that idea that obviously messages you're getting from your body through your senses and that kind of thing are really important, but there is this kind of interaction. So that whole question of if I was just a brain in a jar, would my experience be the same? Embodied cognition is saying actually it wouldn't be quite the same. But that doesn't mean that the brain isn't responsible for your experiences, if that makes sense. And I think there aren't very many scientists today who would say that the mind is something separate from the brain. That was it's known as Cartesian dualism. It was Rene Descartes' theory that the mind was this kind of eerie, floaty thing that was separate from the brain and the body. And we now think that the mind is is created by the brain, is is produced by it. Um, some people talk about it as sort of like the software running on the computer of the brain. Exactly how you define them is still quite challenging. But I think, yes, there's pretty good agreement that the brain is the heart of it, the brain of it. Well, that weird floaty thing, I mean, it makes up so much of who we are. But would you say we're our neurons or would you say that we're our neurotransmitters? I mean, what is the most important thing and process that's happening in the brain? I mean, I think you can't really have one without the other. So Mm -hmm. the neurons on their own, they can send a message along one neuron, but it wouldn't be able to get to the next neuron. So if there were no neurotransmitters, your brain wouldn't work at all. But equally, if there were no neurons, your brain wouldn't work at all. So really, (laughs) it's both of them. I think what I found really interesting when doing my kind of reading and talking to scientists and researching for this book was neurons can change and they do change. And there are some relatively fast ways they can change, but the fast ways tend to involve the chemicals. Mm. 
So you can get structural changes in the brain where uh, new dendrites, the, hang on, I'm going to get a prop here. So this is a, a small neuron, a cuddly version of a neuron. So it's got this long bit that sends messages. And then there are kind of frondy bits at each end. And these frondy bits are where they connect up to the next neuron. So in order for the message to get from the end of one neuron to the start of the next one, it has to pass via chemicals. And mm-hmm. you can get neurons to grow more dendrites, so more of these frondy bits. And that is an actual kind of structural change. But more often, the, the fast changes that are happening in our brain are to do with the chemicals. So either the neurons releasing more chemicals, or sometimes there are changes in the receptors that receive them. But often it's just a case of a different chemical is released and that changes the way the neurons function. So those kind of moment by moment changes that we all experience experience, I would argue the chemicals are probably more important than the neurons. I mean, that's what you really focus on in your latest book is this this brain chemical is the multitude of different ways they act and, and react, the, the soup and the cocktail at which makes up <laughs> our experience. But uh, what do you think is the most misunderstood thing when it comes to brain chemicals? I think people have an idea that one chemical has one job to do and that Mm -hmm. is all that it does. So, you know, serotonin is the happy hormone. You hear people saying that all the time or um, dopamine is addictive, those kinds of ideas. Whereas actually, when you start looking into it, these chemicals have so many different effects and particularly serotonin has really different roles in different parts of the brain. And it's probably the least well understood of the brain chemicals that I talk about in the book. And it's very much not just more serotonin equals more happiness. (laughs) Well, in, in that case, what are some of the best ways to scientifically understand the chemicals in the human brain? Yeah, so it is quite difficult because obviously there's only so much you can do when experimenting on humans. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we know about the chemicals is actually more to do with effects that happen when you give people drugs that we know affect levels of different chemicals. Or um, if you kind of change the levels of what the chemicals are made of. So there was a whole sort of tranche of research on serotonin that was done Mm. by depleting people of the amino acid that your body needs in order to make serotonin. So if you give people a particular diet that doesn't have any tryptophan in it, your body can't make serotonin. And over the course of a couple of days of that diet, levels of serotonin all throughout the brain start decreasing. Um, so this was is, is one of the ways that you can do it. You could also give people drugs that boost levels of one of the neurotransmitters and see what happens. Or sometimes we kind of work backwards. So if there's a disease that we know affects one of the neurotransmitters, and then we can look at the symptoms and say, so for example, Parkinson's disease is caused by the death of neurons in an area of the brain that produce most of the dopamine that then goes throughout the brain. So people with Parkinson's have chronically low levels of dopamine, and we know that they have a lot of problems with movement. So we can say from that, that dopamine is important for movement. But in humans, it has to be these kind of indirect measures. In animal studies, you can do some more kind of direct things. You can actually inject stuff into their brain and change levels kind of more directly. Obviously, scientists are very careful to do these things in as humane a way as they can, but animal studies are indispensable for understanding how these things work. Now, one thing people are so fascinated by when they think about the brain is this mysterious thing called memory. It's it's really Mm. hard to pinpoint where a memory is, but perhaps our brain chemicals can start to help us to understand the mystery that is memory. So from a brain chemical perspective, Ginny, what do you think memory might be? So actually, we have a pretty good understanding of the process of storing memories. So we know that there's an area Mm -hmm. of the brain deep inside called the hippocampus, which is absolutely vital for creating new memories. Um, And we know that because there have been people who have had damage to this area of the brain and they 
become unable to form new memories. They Mm -hmm. can still remember things from the past, but they can't form any new ones. But we know that memories don't stay in the hippocampus for a long time because these people who've damaged the hippocampus, they've still got those memories from a long time ago. So what scientists now think is that memories start forming in the hippocampus and then over time they're kind of moved to the cortex of the brain which is the mm-hmm. the top layer the wrinkly bit where there's a lot more space and memories seem to be stored as combinations of neurons so it's not one neuron is one memory it's like a network and that means that you've got a huge amount of capacity because you've got billions of neurons and then if you're joining hundred of them up to make each memory. Think about how many different ways there are. You can join up yeah. billions of neurons. That's that's um, huge numbers. So that seems to be where memories are stored in the long term. Where the chemicals come in are, when I say a network of neurons, mm-hmm. what do I mean by that? So our whole brain is a network of neurons, but what you can do is you can strengthen the connections between sets of neurons. And this is what happens during learning. So most of the neurons in our brain use a chemical called glutamate Mm -hmm. to communicate. That's the one that when the first neuron releases it, it excites the second one. It makes it more likely to fire. So what happens during learning is you're repeatedly activating the same pairs of neurons over and over again. And that starts to initiate changes in them through the release of lots and lots of glutamate. So what happens is the first neuron actually starts to make more glutamate so that it's got lots of it ready to release. And the second neuron starts to build more receptors for that glutamate so that it can receive it more easily. Now, if you're trying to pass a message between two things and suddenly you've got more messenger and more Hmm. things to receive that message, it's a lot easier for it to pass across the synapse. So what we say is we've strengthened that connection. We've strengthened that synapse. And that's what a memory is. It's a network of neurons with strong synapses between them. Um, So it's all down to this, this passing of glutamate from one neuron to the other. Well, if memory and and learning, as you've just shared there, if that's a brain chemical process, does that mean there's ways to possibly improve memory? Yeah, that is a great question. There has been a lot of interest in cognitive enhancing drugs, Mm -hmm. and a lot of them actually started off as treatments for brain diseases, brain brain conditions. So a couple of the drugs that were brought in to treat ADHD, attention hyperactivity deficit disorder. (laughs) Uh, Mouthful, that's why people call it ADHD. Um, So things like Ritalin and some of those are actually now being used apparently by university students and sometimes even school students because they people think they make it easier for you to pay attention and help Mm. you learn better. Now, what was really interesting when I started reading around this topic was that the research doesn't actually back up the fact that these drugs help people who are neurotypical Mm -hmm. to learn better. So if you have ADHD, these drugs do help, but that's because you're starting at sort of a lower baseline. So you're getting boosted up to the kind of average point. If you start at average, actually increasing something doesn't necessarily make you better than average. And actually, there was one really interesting study that found that people who took Ritalin actually thought that they were doing better on the tasks that they were doing, but they weren't actually doing any better. So it makes you think you're working harder and faster and smarter, but it doesn't actually necessarily give you that effect if it's not being prescribed for you. There's another really interesting drug called modafinil, which Mm -hmm. does seem to have more positive effects in lab studies. And that was brought in to treat narcolepsy. So narcolepsy is an illness where people fall asleep at random times where they don't want to, sometimes when they experience stress or laughter or kind of strong emotions. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know how modafinil works in the brain, but it seemed to help people with narcolepsy. And it also seems to help people without the condition to stay awake for long times and to keep focused and to keep concentrating. So there is, some people have been talking about using it for the armed forces or perhaps for pilots or surgeons who need to stay awake for a long time 
time and it's really, really important that they focus. There's an awful lot of ethical concerns that come up mm. when you start talking about using these drugs in the kind of general population. And my big concern is that most of the research that's been done on them hasn't been done for the long term in a healthy population. And it hasn't been done over the long term in children. So the idea that school kids and and I include university students in that because we know that your brain doesn't finish maturing until you're about 25. So the fact that people whose brains haven't fully finished brewing yet mm. are taking unnecessary drugs. I yeah, I'd want to know more about the long-term consequences before I became a regular user. There's there's good evidence that the occasional use is safe, but we just don't know over the long term in the healthy population whether it is is going to have any changes, cause any changes to the brain. I mean, some of the drugs that you mentioned are, are problematic because, in part, they're they're not necessarily legal to use in, in a recreational uh, setting. But there's a lot of excitement about legal nootropics. I mean, do you think some of these things help the brain through changing its chemical makeup, or do you think really the placebo effect is having a, a large impact there? I would be very cautious of anyone trying to sell you anything that claims <laughs> to change levels of neurotransmitters in the brain for a few uh -huh. different reasons. One is that a lot of the things we take, drugs and foods and things, don't get into the brain at all. We have something called the blood-brain barrier, which means that our main blood system is kind of blocked off from the liquid that actually feeds our brain. And it's really important because it means that pathogens can't get in and toxins and things from the body can't get in. And it's got kind of special transporters, so it lets in the things it needs to. But this is still a big issue that scientists are trying to deal with when they're developing drugs for brain conditions, because mm. a lot of them, they really struggle to get them into the brain. So the idea that someone could give you a supplement that is Definitely. Yeah, th there's that to start with. Is it actually going to get into the brain? And then there's the question of, do we want to boost a neurotransmitter? And do we want to boost it everywhere? Because the idea that because something is good, more of it is better, just isn't the case in the brain. Uh -huh. And I think it was Dean Burnett used this analogy in one of his books that I really liked. And it was that if you have a plate of food that doesn't have any salt on it, it might be a bit bland. But if you covered the entire plate with salt, <laughs> that's not going to make it taste any better. There's this kind of, there's, there's a, a, a Goldilocks point, a perfect point in the brain for the amount of chemicals that we need. And that varies depending on the part of the brain. And it could also vary person to person. So the idea that something is going to boost a chemical everywhere in the brain, I'd be a bit worried about that, particularly mm. as these neurotropics probably haven't been through the rigorous testing that drugs that are prescribed by doctors have been through. And there have been cases in the past of people taking things that they think are safe because they're natural. And natural doesn't necessarily mean safe. There are plenty of natural things that are not safe. Mm. And there have also been cases where people take supplements and things that they think contain one thing. And when they're actually tested in a lab, they contain something completely different. So I'm very wary of that sort of thing. That was my long-winded way of saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so wonderful how you describe the delicate relationship between all these brain chemicals that are working on, on the brain and, and the body. And one chemical that just seems to be getting a bad rap in the 21st century is dopamine. But in fact, dopamine, there's an important reason that exists in the human brain, isn't there? Yeah. So I think people get this idea of sort of dopamine addiction and mm -hmm. we're all looking at our smartphones all the time and we're slave to dopamine. And as with most of these things, it sort of comes from a kernel of truth. Dopamine mm -hmm. is 
released in certain areas of the brain to drive you towards a goal. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, dopamine also keeps us motivated to do our work because mm -hmm. we want to reach that end point or to go on that run because you, you're motivated to get out and get healthy or that sort of thing. So I think it gets a bit of a bad rap. There's also the idea that dopamine is a pleasure chemical. Mm -hmm. And this one has actually been pretty much disproven now, but it sort of hung around a bit. And that's because dopamine is released in the brain when we do something that's good for us evolutionarily. So mm -hmm. that could be eating, drinking, having sex, or doing something that might get us towards one of those three things, because really those are probably the most important things in terms of evolution. So you do see dopamine release in response to these things, but it's not actually the experience of pleasure. It's the motivation to get you there. So there were some great experiments done on rats that found that if you depleted levels of dopamine in in their brain and then gave them a choice between some really bland food, but they could have it without having to work for it mm -hmm. or some tasty sugary food, but they had to like scramble over a little wall to get to it. Normal healthy rats would tend to put in more work to get the good food. But if you deplete dopamine in their brain, they can't be bothered and they just eat the boring food. But if they don't have to work for it, they'll go for the tasty food and they still enjoy the tasty food when they eat it. So it's not actually their pleasure, the reward, it's the drive to go and get that thing. So actually dopamine is really, really important in keeping us motivated and keeping us kind of moving forwards towards goals. I think the reason it has got that reputation is also because it is implicated in addiction as well. So when people become addicted to a, a substance or it could be gambling or something, what happens is their dopamine system kind of gets co-opted and ends up driving them towards that goal. So their only goal becomes getting more of that drug or, or doing that thing. And one of the reasons for that is a lot of drugs of abuse cause the release of lots of dopamine in the brain. So your brain thinks, oh, I'm doing something that's really good for my survival. I should do this again. But obviously it's just been tricked because of that extra release of dopamine. And the other thing that can happen that happens in all sorts of areas of the brain is that if you have an awful lot of one chemical, your brain sort of tries to fight back. Mm. So if you are taking a drug like, say, cocaine, which does cause huge amounts of dopamine in the brain, then your brain will start down-regulating the amount of dopamine it produces normally and also the receptors that respond to it. And that means that it's sort of affected a bit less by the drug, which is why people often find they have to start taking more and more of it. But it also means that kind of everyday goals become less important because, well, they're only producing a tiny bit of dopamine and now I'm not very sensitive to it. Mm. And that's one of the reasons we think that the drug can sort of try and start becoming the main goal that people have. So I think it's that kind of two-way street. But again, it's illustrating that point that we need some dopamine because otherwise we wouldn't have any get up and go to do anything. But if you have too much of it, it can cause problems. And actually, people who are given dopamine boosting drugs to treat, say, Parkinson's, mm -hmm. sometimes end up with what we call impulse control disorders. So that might be that they start gambling or compulsively shopping, or some people become hypersexual, but all these things that where their their sort of their drives become more important and they find it harder to control them. So, so the, the idea of a dopamine detox, is that something that we should consider or is that just a, just a, one of those popular phrases that's become very uh, associated with the idea of getting away from social media because it has an effect on our brain? So that, I mean, if, if you are a drug user, then yes, the yeah. idea of detox is a thing and you might have some kind of symptoms as you're going through that, as your brain readjusts its levels of neurotransmitters. The idea that we can reset our dopamine levels by ignoring our phones for a bit. I, mm, The amount of dopamine released in your brain when you get a notification on your phone is not sort of drug levels of dopamine. It's, it's natural levels. I think the kind of 
I, I meant said that that eating, drinking, and having sex are the most important things evolutionarily, but actually that's not true. Being sociable is mm. re- was really important as well, and the kind of the likes and the follows and all of that sort of stuff on social media is really just an extension of having friends in real life. So yes, it is causing dopamine release, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Mm. That isn't to say that you won't feel better after a weekend turning your phone off. Whether there's any evidence that it will do anything to your dopamine levels, I'm I'm dubious on that. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's, that's fascinating. I mean, I, I still <laughs> bemoan and I often miss my pre-internet brain because uh, despite the fact that going on a dopamine detox from social media won't necessarily affect the dopamine levels in our brain, it does feel like technology does have some affects on the brain from the glowing light of our screens to to some of those notifications there is mm. something going on there that's that's changing the chemistry of our brain do you agree or or in actual fact yeah. it's just yeah so i think there's there's some elements of that so one thing is that we're we're always multitasking now mm-hmm. People have become, particularly when you're on video meetings and things, people are also checking their phone or they're also doing their emails. And we know that the brain is really bad at multitasking. So you can multitask if the things you're doing are in completely different domains. So if you are walking and listening to a podcast, that's fine because that uses different areas of the brain. But if you are reading and listening to a podcast, both of that is going to use the language areas of the brain and your brain can't do it. So you might think you're doing both, but what you're actually doing is you're switching between the two and that is really inefficient and really tiring for the brain. So the fact that we have notifications going off all the time and you know, you're trying to write and then your phone dings and you look at your email and you read it and then you think, oh, well, I'll reply to that later. But by that point, you've forgotten what you're writing. I do think that is having an impact on us in terms of kind of making us less efficient at what we're doing at that time. The other thing you picked up on there was the light thing. And that is really interesting because Mm. light is really important in setting our body clocks. So how we know when to wake up in the morning and when to go to sleep in the evening is partly down to our internal body clock. And anyone who's ever flown more than a few hours knows the feeling when your body clock is out of sync when you're jet lagged. Mm. But the thing is, your body clock can change. And that's why jet lag does get better over a few days. And the way it does that is through light exposure. So when we see bright light, it's detected by cells in the back of our eyes and sent to a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, um, which is kind of the um, driving force for body clocks all throughout your body that keeps them kind of all synced up. Um, And the suprachiasmatic nucleus is responsible for releasing melatonin, which it releases in the evening. And that's one of the chemicals that helps make us feel sleepy. So it uses bright light in the morning to know kind of how many hours later to start releasing melatonin. But it also does that based on the fact that it's now getting dark. So the problem is that a lot of us spend our evenings in front of very bright screens Mm. and they mean that our suprachiasmatic nucleus is getting all these signals telling it it's still daytime. So it's delaying the release of that melatonin. And that we think is one reason some people find it harder to sleep in the evenings. So generally trying to dim your screens as much as possible in the evenings. There's also some evidence that blue light might affect us more than the sort of yellow lower ends of the spectrum. So there are some filters and things you can get that turn your screens more yellowy, uh, red and less blue, which which some people find helps. But that is definitely a way that that staring at bright things might be affecting our, our brains and changing the levels of chemicals in them. I mean, should that be a worry? Should we worry that humans are so easily programmable by simply manipulating (laughs) their brain chemicals? Or is this just a a feature of being human? I think it's actually a real positive Mm. about being human because humans are the most flexible species on Earth. We're the only species that has managed to make a home in 
places that we're not designed to live in. If you took a lion cub to the Arctic, it wouldn't survive very long. But if you took a baby that was born in the tropics to the Arctic, I mean, not like don't leave it alone. If you took a family, <laughs> if you took a family this is, this of lions. This is a really unethical a experiment. Yeah, uh, I'm not uh, saying you yeah. should do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what I'm saying is humans have found ways to live in places that we're not yeah. evolved to live in. By using technology, we've built houses, we've created warm coats, we've done all these things that change the way we live. And that is the reason that we are so successful. And the reason we can do that is because our brains are so flexible. There are plenty of animals who have behaviors that are hardwired into their brain and they will just do that thing even if it doesn't make any sense to continue doing it. Humans have more flexibility than that. And I think that's a real strength. I guess if you're talking about kind of external manipulation of brain chemicals, you do start some of the stuff that I've been writing about, you do start sort of veering into those kind of science fiction areas of could we start wiping people's memories? Could we start changing people's behavior through chemistry? And I guess... Yes, <laughs> we could. But also we kind of, we have been for a very long time as well. Mm. So alcohol, for example, changes our behavior when we drink it. Is that a bad, I mean, sometimes it's a bad thing. Sometimes it's a good thing. Coffee, caffeine changes our behavior. Humans have for a very long time been using drugs that change our brains. Obviously, we should be cautious and we know that some of these drugs can do damage. Alcohol is a prime example. It can be very, very harmful to the brain if you use too much of it. So yes, we should be careful, but it's not a new idea. I mean, the, the thing with the idea that there's all these chemicals acting on the brain, well, we usually just don't think about them. This is just something that happens in the background. And the only time we do become aware of them is when there's an imbalance. And quite often that imbalance expresses itself in things like depression and stress. So uh, with depression, uh, that's often seen as a chemical imbalance, but there's something so much more complicated going on there, isn't there? Yeah. So it's a really interesting idea that problems with serotonin, low serotonin levels cause depression. And this is one of those areas where it was kind of worked out backwards. Scientists found that there were some drugs that when they were given to people, in some people caused depression. And those drugs affected serotonin levels. So they sort of deduced that low serotonin levels must be the cause of depression. Then they developed drugs that would boost serotonin levels and they found that in many people that made them feel better. So it's a nice sort of simple story that you've got low serotonin. Um, the most commonly used drugs are SSRIs, which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So when a chemical is released from a neuron, it travels across the synapse to the second neuron, but some of it is also kind of sucked back up into the first neuron to be recycled. So what these do is they block that vacuum cleaner process. Um, and that means that there's more serotonin in the synapse for longer so it can have more of an effect. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Apart from there are a few areas where it doesn't. So for example, it takes SSRIs about six weeks on average to make people feel better. But when you block those reuptake inhibitors, within an hour or so, you've got more serotonin hanging around. So why is it taking so long to actually make people feel better? And then there's the fact that there's quite a high proportion of people that don't feel better after taking SSRIs. So I think it's something like only about three in 10 patients respond to the first drug that they are given. Um, and then, of course, they have to wait six weeks to see if it works before they try another one. Um, and then sometimes doctors will try a second SSRI and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And then they might move on to a different type of antidepressant that affects other chemicals in the brain as well. So actually, we don't fully know what causes depression. And there are quite a few different theories. But I think it's likely that it's not the same reason 
in everyone, that maybe there are some people that have low serotonin levels, but maybe there are others who don't. And it's a different mechanism. And depression is actually more like a symptom rather than a disease in itself. So it's more like saying, I've got a pain in my arm. Well, that pain could be caused by all sorts of different things, but treating it the same in everyone, which is kind of what we do at the moment because we don't have any ways of working out what the underlying cause is, or at least none that are in regular clinical use. So I think this is a really big area and scientists are making some really interesting discoveries as to kind of different mechanisms that can lead to depression and how we might be able to group people into different kind of underlying causes. Um, I think it's quite an exciting area for the future. I mean, the wonderful thing about human beings is, is if you just dig a little deeper, you realize there's always a reason for some weird thing that we <laughs> happen to do. And do you think there's any perhaps hidden evolutionary advantages to being able to have depressive symptoms? Do, do you think there's a reason this is something that can happen with the brain? Well, one of the theories of what causes depression is that it's to do with inflammation in mm. the body. Um, so inflammation is something that happens when we're injured or when we're ill, and it's the body's way of trying to deal with that. So it, it's a good thing in the short term. Um, so if you have a cut on your arm, the area becomes red and it becomes sore, and that's as more blood is going towards it to kind of deal with it and make sure it doesn't get infected. So mm -hmm. inflammation isn't always a bad thing. But when we have lots of inflammation in the body, it produces these little tiny chemical messengers called pro-inflammatory cytokines. And some of them can cross over into the brain. And we think that these are what produce what's known as illness behavior. So if you think about the last time you had a really nasty cold or fluey thing, obviously you have the kind of the, the stuffed up symptoms and the headaches and stuff, but that feeling of lethargy and kind of not wanting to do anything, just wanting to curl up in a ball and rest, that we think might be being produced by these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And that would be a evolutionarily beneficial if you were ill, because it would mean that you would preserve your energy. You wouldn't be out kind of running around. You give your body the best chance to fight off that illness. And also you wouldn't be spreading it to other people because you're kind of isolating yourself. Mm. So one idea is that in some people, depression might be caused by this inflammation process kind of running a bit wild and they're not actually ill, but they've still got these pro-inflammatory cytokines making their brain think that they're ill. So they have this sickness behavior, this fatigue, lethargy, um, kind of not wanting to go out and do things. Um, and those are all symptoms of depression. So that would sort of, there, there was originally an evolutionary benefit for it, but it's gone a bit wrong mm. and that could lead to depression. And there's some really interesting work. They found that people who do have high levels of these inflammatory markers in their blood are less likely to respond to SSRIs. So there might actually be in the not too distant future the possibility of testing people for inflammation when they come in with depression and then treating them differently if they have high levels of inflammation than if they don't, which I think is quite cool. Do you think there's a relationship between depression and, and stress and specifically thinking about how COVID-19 has really impacted the brain over this, this period of lockdown? Yeah, definitely. So there's very strong links between life stresses, big negative life events and particularly prolonged life events mm -hmm. um, and depression. You're much more likely to suffer depression if bad things have happened to you. And that again is probably linked to chemicals. So just to sort of go back to the beginning, what happens when we're stressed? Stress is again, an evolutionary response. It's part of our fight or flight system. Mm -hmm. So if you see something that might be a threat to you, your body needs to get into the right state to deal with that threat. So to either fight it off, run away from it, or sometimes freeze and play dead. <sighs> and that's done through two different pathways. One of them is uses your nerves and goes straight down to your body and that's a very quick one. And then there's also a slightly slower pathway, which is carried by chemicals. So mostly adrenaline and cortisol, which you might've heard called the stress mm -hmm. chemical, which yeah, it is, <laughs> but also it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, it always is. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what we think happens is 
we have evolved for short, sharp stresses. Mm -hmm. So a bear appearing in front of us or, oh my gosh, there's no food today. We need to go out and get, you know, those kind of short term stresses. In the modern world, a lot of what we're stressed about is very long term mm. stuff. And it's also not stuff that you can run away from. So it's a boss who's putting loads of pressure on you at work or it's money troubles or it's COVID pandemic, which has gone on for over a year. So lots of us are experiencing prolonged release of these stress chemicals. Mm -hmm. And that can have quite a lot of knock-on effects on the body because putting you in that heightened state means your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases, and also your body kind of shuts down any processes that aren't vital. So that includes digestion, um, which is why when people are very, very scared, they sometimes um, evacuate themselves mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> because your body doesn't want to have to deal with dealing with waste. Uh -huh. You also turns off your immune system or it damps down your immune system because in that moment, you don't want to put energy into keeping your immune system going. Mm. But that means that if we are stressed over the long term, these things which have evolved to protect us in the short term can start having negative effects. And we know that long-term stress can put you at increased risk of cardiovascular problems. It causes headaches. It causes all sorts of different things. You're more likely to get infections. Mm -hmm. So actually, ironically, and telling people this doesn't actually help, being scared about COVID means you're more likely to get COVID yeah. if you come in contact with it because your immune system will be working less well, which is horribly ironic. Uh. So we think that Basically, if you are stressed for a very long time, some of these knock-on effects can happen in the brain as well. And normally, as well as the emotional system, which detects threats and kind of kicks off this stress reaction, our prefrontal cortex, which is just behind our forehead, acts as the kind of rational karma downer. Mm -hmm. So have you ever had that thing where you think you see something out the corner of your eye that might be a snake or a spider and you sort of start to jump and then you look at it properly and you realize it's just a hose pipe or a bit of fluff or something. Yeah, so that, occasionally. Yeah. So that's your amygdala kicking off about a threat uh -huh. and then your prefrontal cortex going, no, no, don't worry. It's okay. It's not actually a threat. So one of the things that seems to happen in prolonged stress is that the connections between those two areas of the brain stop working quite as well. And that means that your prefrontal cortex can't calm down the emotional response as easily. And that seems to be one of the things that contributes to depression, a kind of imbalance between these two systems. Mm -hmm. So we think that's one of the ways that prolonged stress can, can lead to depression um, through kind of not being able to calm your emotional reactivity. So, so in that case, why is ketamine such a great drug? I mean, that's just unrelated. I just want to know why ketamine is awesome. <laughs> yeah. So ketamine is a really new concept in terms of treating depression. Uh -huh. And it works in a few different ways. So one of the ways is it seems to boost the levels of a chemical called GABA. That's an acronym. I'm not going to say the whole name because no one needs to know that. Um, and it's I get it wrong sometimes. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's a very long word. Um, and GABA does the opposite of glutamate that we talked about earlier. So mm -hmm. glutamate is excitatory. It turns neurons on. It gets them firing. GABA sort of calms them down. And low levels of GABA have been linked to anxiety. And ketamine seems to boost levels of GABA. So that's one mechanism. The other mechanism is slightly more complicated, but also I think more interesting. So glutamate has two different, at least two different receptors. Mm -hmm. And normally lots of glutamate in your brain is toxic. It's really bad news. You don't want your brain to be overexcited and firing all the time. What ketamine does is it blocks one of the glutamate receptors and it seems to be that one that makes it toxic. So at the same time, it causes the release of more glutamate. So you've now got loads of glutamate and it can't bind to its normal receptor. So it has to bind to a different receptor. And that receptor seems to cause an effect where it boosts neurogenesis. So mm. it boosts the birth of new neurons or the growth of new neurons. And this is something that only happens, we think, in certain parts of the brain, including the hippocampus. And people with depression seem to have smaller 
volume in some of these areas of the hippocampus. So one other theory of depression is that they have reduced neurogenesis, that their hippocampus isn't producing new neurons. They're not growing the way they should be. So ketamine seems to be boosting neurogenesis in that area of the brain, we think. Mm -hmm. And it works really quickly. So I mentioned SSRIs take about six weeks to work. Ketamine can work in a few hours, mm. which is kind of amazing. And actually another theory for how SSRIs work or how serotonin's involved is that it may be acting as a growth factor, encouraging this growth of new neurons, but it's a, a long, slow process to get there. Whereas ketamine sort of goes straight in, encourages this growth of new neurons. And that might be how it how it helps. But it's really exciting because it seems to work in people who have tried everything, mm. who've tried all the drugs um, and who have really severe depression. There have even been cases of people who've been experiencing suicidal thoughts and one dose of ketamine has made them feel so much better that they've been able to go home from hospital. And it seems to last a reasonable length of time as well. Mm. So there's there's still ongoing studies in kind of how many doses, how much, what spacing you need, how long the benefits last. But it's it's a really exciting area. I think people are quite nervous of it because ketamine has this reputation of being a street drug, yeah. but actually it's used as an anesthetic in hospitals all the time. And it's really well tolerated in that environment. And for depression, you're using much lower doses than you would be for an anesthetic. So yeah, I think it's I think it's quite an interesting, quite an exciting area of research. I mean, it, it does feel like we still have a long way to go because there are so many negative side effects associated with something like ketamine. But listening to you speak there, it feels like we really do, if we choose to, we really do have the ability to change our brains. But changing our brain can be a really complicated process, can't it? Things like emotions can often get in the way of effective brain change. So we've talked about how drugs can change the brain, but the things that you do can change the brain as well. Mm -hmm. So we've known for a long time that just sticking with depression for a moment, exercise is a really good antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And that might also be through this process of neurogenesis because exercise seems to boost the levels of another chemical that increases neurogenesis. So just doing something like exercising can change the chemicals in your brain and change your behavior. But so can repeating things and practicing things. That's how you make things a habit is just by doing them over and over again. And by doing that, again, you're changing your brain, you're changing the wiring, the connections between neurons. Um, so there are all sorts of re sort of behavioral ways that you can change your brain as well. I mean, it, it constantly feels like we're in such a delicate balance when it comes to our brains. It feels like almost anything could just push us over the edge. And it's in those moments where we kind of have a, a weird sort of fight with our brain where we learn the most. And I know you've had your own unique challenge with your brain, which was related to uh, chronic fatigue. And I just wonder, what did that teach you about the brain in general and more importantly, your own brain? Yeah, well, so I have um, chronic fatigue syndrome, mm -hmm. which is basically not understood at all. Scientists don't know what causes it, which as the kind of person who always wants the answers to stuff <laughs> is really, really difficult to live with. Um, and it is... But there, there is some research going on. It does seem to be a physical disease. So what we think happens is that basically our cells can't produce energy in the way most people's do. Mm -hmm. And they have to use a kind of different pathway to produce energy, which produces side effects, like diff chemical side effects. And one of those might be these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So quite a lot of people with chronic fatigue syndrome do also suffer from depression. But also some of the symptoms of fatigue are quite similar to the symptoms of depression. So it is it is a different disease and it isn't just a brain disease. It is, it is a sort of whole body systematic thing. Mm -hmm. But it was really interesting when I started reading about how these cytokines affect the brain, sort of the similarities that I saw there and the work that's going on to try and figure out exactly what they do 
in the brain and how we might be able to counter them might be able to help not just people with depression, but people with fatigue as a symptom. So um, obviously there's, there's all the people with chronic fatigue syndrome, which is also called ME often, but also things like people who've had chemotherapy often experience severe fatigue as a side effect. Um, it's a side effect of drugs that treat diseases like Huntington's and if we can work out what's going on in the brain and the body to cause that, it might be able to help with some of these symptoms. I don't think it would cure the ME in terms of what's going on in my cells, but if it could reduce the fatigue and the brain fog that is is kind of a part of that, that would be amazing. Yeah. But it's a little way off. Although with slightly off topic, but with all the um, experiences of long COVID that are coming out, which is is heartbreaking because right at the beginning of the pandemic, I was sort of sitting there because my my illness started with a virus. So I was sort of sitting there with everyone talking about the death rates going, yeah, but what about all the people who are going to get ME? Yeah. <laughs> because we know that a proportion of people who contract a virus get these long-term symptoms and we are now seeing it. And some people with long COVID have symptoms very similar to ME. So I'm kind of hopeful that there might be more research on it now um, with the kind of profiles being raised. But I've had to learn to be super efficient with my mm. energy and to manage. I know when my brain works best and how to kind of do the things that I need to be. So I tend to do difficult writing and things first thing in the morning because that's when my brain works best. Mm. So yeah, it's definitely kind of taught me to to manage those sorts of things very very carefully and yeah be very efficient with my energy i mean there's there's so much we can do we, we, we often go to the gym to look after our bodies but there's so much we can do to look after our brains and one of those things is sleep it's it's so important for our brain and and there's a big question mark still over why we even sleep in the first place so how much sleep do you think we need why do we sleep and, and what do you think that does to the brain how long have you got? <laughs> well, don't send me it's, to sleep. No, it's, You'd be concerned. <laughs> it's, it's a really interesting question. I think the amount of sleep we need varies from person to person. Uh -huh. um, so adults on average need seven to eight hours. I need about 10, partly because of my illness. I know that I function better and also I don't sleep particularly well. Mm. Um, so I need to have about 10 hours in bed to try and get a decent length of sleep. I know some people who are fine on six or seven. People who say they can get by on less than that are probably deluding themselves. So there is a gene that has been discovered that if you have that gene variant, you are fine on four or five hours sleep, mm. but it is super rare. So I think the stats are something like you're more likely to be struck by lightning than to have this gene variant. Wow. It's really, really rare. So if you think you have it, you probably don't. So most of us need seven to eight hours sleep a night. But as you say, we don't know exactly why we need to sleep, but we do know that there are a lot of things going on in the brain while we sleep. So one of them that seems to be really important is that our brain kind of cleans itself while we're asleep. Mm. So we have fluid that surrounds our brain and kind of moves through it. But while we sleep, our brain cells actually shrink slightly. And that means that the fluid can move more easily. And it washes away some of the kind of byproducts that build up throughout the day as our brains go about doing their thing. And one of the byproducts that it washes away is is amyloid plaques, mm. uh, which have been linked to Alzheimer's. So there's some suggestion that sleep is protective against Alzheimer's. And um, that's not to say that you definitely can't get it if you get eight hours a night, but it seems that there is a link there. Again, it's a really difficult thing to study mm. because we're talking over 50 years of your life, the amount of sleep you get might affect your chances of getting Alzheimer's. But we also know that Alzheimer's makes it harder to sleep. So there's kind of a, it's yeah. really hard, it's sort of chicken and egg thing. So it's very hard to kind of say, 
definitively. Um, but it does seem like that's one of the processes, this sort of cleaning cycle mm -hmm. um, that's going on while we sleep. And there's also all sorts of other things. So that process of storing memories in the cortex, that happens while we sleep. Um, and it's not just a case of sort of moving them one for one. Your brain also kind of extracts the gist out of them, incorporates them with other memories. So that's where, you know, the idea that if you've been struggling with something, you should sleep on it and make a decision in the morning. Actually, that's really good advice because your brain will be processing that information overnight and you probably will wake up with a better idea of how it's working. And we also think that some emotional processing might go on overnight as well. So kind of dealing mm. with difficult emotions that have come up during the day. And certainly poor sleep is linked to a lot of mental health disorders as well. So it's very strongly linked with depression. People with depression mm. often suffer insomnia. Sometimes they get hypersomnia and sleep too much, but there definitely seem to be links there as well. But again, depression can also make it harder to sleep. So it's kind of a, yeah. it's a, a cycle thing, it's, it's, which it's, can be, it's such <laughs> be a, a bit tricky. Yeah, complicated, complicated and, and odd relationship. All these things seem to feed into into each other. But I do like the idea that there mm. is a Maggie Thatcher gene that uh, allows people to sleep for four hours a night. And, and I think it's unlikely <laughs> she had it, though. <laughs> really? Ah. I think so. I was trying to remember. I can't remember. There have been two families that have been found that had it. I can't remember where in the world they were, but I don't think they were in the UK. So she might, but I think it's unlikely. That's, that's, that's fascinating. Well, it's not just sleep, but it's also diet that has a massive impact on our brain. The food that we eat can fundamentally change how our brain operates and works on a daily basis, can't it? Yeah, it can. But actually, it's really good news because basically the best diet for your brain is also the best diet for your heart. So if you've been eating kind of everything that you've always been told to eat or not eat to look after your heart, so not too much red meat, not too much huge amounts of sugar and salt and kind of lots of fruit and vegetables, lots of fiber, all of those things that are good for your heart are also good for your brain. And that's because a lot of keeping your brain healthy is to do with keeping the blood flowing to it well. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that tends to deteriorate as we age. So we've got a whole load of blood vessels all over the surface of our brain that deliver blood and then it goes through the blood-brain barrier and turns into brain fluid, but that brings oxygen and nutrients to the brain. And if blood isn't flowing through those very well, then that can cause all sorts of problems. So if you get a blockage, it could lead to a stroke. But also we think that just sort of slight uh, deterioration of blood flow is a factor in all sorts of dementias. So possibly Alzheimer's, certainly there's something called vascular dementia, which is all to do with blood flow. But we think that keeping blood flowing to your brain mm -hmm. through good diet and also exercise and keeping your heart healthy is super, super important. There've been some indications that there might be a couple of other things that are useful for the brain. So blueberries and basically anything that is kind of that kind of purpley colour has a chemical in it, which seem it's a it's a type of antioxidant, which seems to be quite good for the brain. But again, these studies tend to be over the long term, mm. asking people what they eat and then looking at their brain health. There aren't many studies because they'd be very expensive and very hard to do where you feed someone blueberries every day for 60 <laughs> years and then see how they do compared to someone who is never allowed to eat blueberries. Uh -huh. it, it's just too difficult and expensive to do those studies. So they all tend to be correlational. And of course, there are all sorts of other factors that people who eat better are also likely to be perhaps socioeconomically more privileged or live in better areas or have more opportunities for education. So it can be quite hard to kind of disentangle those. But certainly if you want to look after your brain, looking after your heart is a really good place to start. It seems like there's so many methods through which we could look after our brain and potentially build the brain that we really want. But when it comes to decision making, there's something else going on there, isn't there? It's, it doesn't necessarily correlate that because we look after our brain, we're necessarily going to make good decisions. Often it feels like we're constantly trying to fight and negotiate with <laughs> our brains. Yeah, so... Decision making is quite an interesting one because 
there's sort of different parts of your brain that effectively want different things. Mm -hmm. So the kind of dopamine driven system and the reward system um, deep in your brain, which is sort of, I guess you can think of as a more primal system, is there to keep you alive and to keep you moving towards things that will keep you Mm -hmm. alive. So that in evolutionary terms was often food. The problem is now there's plenty of food. So actually always Mm. eating is not always the best thing to do to keep yourself healthy. So we have to use the more reasonable parts of our brains, particularly the prefrontal cortex behind our foreheads to kind of damp down those primitive desires. But the problem is that that's difficult and it takes energy and it takes focus. So I use an analogy in the book of the kind of reward system being like a toddler who just wants what they want and they want it now and they're going to have a tantrum if they don't get it. And then the prefrontal cortex is a bit like the parent trying to Mm. sort of reason with them and being like, no, you can't have a chocolate bar now. We're going to have dinner in 10 minutes or no, you can't take off your clothes here. We're in a supermarket, those (laughs) kinds of things. But just like with parents, when your brain is stressed or tired or busy, it's a lot harder to keep control of those drives. Mm. So you can have all the best intentions when you wake up on a Monday morning, but by the time it gets to Friday evening and you've had a really busy week, Mm. you maybe don't feel like going for that run or you just want to get a takeaway pizza, which is fine. Not saying there's anything against takeaway pizza, but if that was the thing you decided not to do on Monday, it can be sometimes quite hard to stick to that. Mm. But the good thing is that if we know that we have problems with that, we can find ways to get around it. So one of the things that often happens is that our desires are triggered by something that we see. So we might be doing quite well at, maybe we've decided we're not going to buy takeaway coffee anymore because we're trying to save up for a holiday. Mm. And you're doing fine with that. And then you walk past to Starbucks and the smell hits your nose and suddenly all you can think about is that iced vanilla latte (laughs) and that is your kind of reward system, your desire system kicking in. Mm -hmm. So what can you do to kind of try and stop that from happening? If you know that it's triggered by walking past the shop, maybe there's a route you can take where you don't walk past the shop. So you're using your reasonable prefrontal cortex to change your behavior to avoid whatever's triggering that that desire. So a similar thing would be a lot of people don't leave the biscuit tin out. They maybe put it up in a cupboard, put it Mm. away if they're trying to avoid eating them. Or I had someone ask me recently how they could stop themselves from eating the whole bag of crisps when they were sitting on the sofa in an evening. And I said, just get a bowl, Uh put some crisps in the bowl (laughs) and put the bag away. And then you'll just eat what's in the bowl and you won't eat the rest of them just because they're there. So these little things that we can do, these we call them commitment devices. Mm. Um, And they're sort of longer term ones as well. So a lot of people, when they're trying to get fit, they might sign up for a charity run or something. And what you've done there is you've made a commitment for the future that you know you can't break. So that kind of means that that oh, I can't be bothered this evening, feeling is overridden by, oh no, but I'm going to make such a fool of myself if I can't manage the 10K. And that can be enough to kind of kick you into gear. So doing these little things with with our more reasonable prefrontal cortex when we're not in that tired, stressed, emotional state can help us avoid those kind of those little um, emotional desires that can trick us out. Mm, it, it often feels like we need a much better relationship with our future selves in many ways, shape or form. Yeah, well, we're really, really bad at both predicting what will be like in the future and predicting kind of what we'll want. So there were some brilliant studies that asked people to choose something for themselves in the future. So I don't know, sometimes you go to a wedding and you have to pick what main course you want, even though the wedding's in like four months time or something. (laughs) And they found that people will tend to pick the healthier option in the future. And then what they did was they gave people an opportunity to switch what they'd chosen on the day. And (laughs) quite a high proportion would switch their healthy snack for a less healthy one on the day. But when they were then asked what they wanted next week, they still went for the healthier option. Mm. So you think that future you 
is going to want the healthy thing, even if current you doesn't. And it's the same for like, you'll pick a highbrow movie to watch in a couple of weeks time, even though tonight all you feel like is a rubbish rom-com or something. Mm. In some ways we have these really high opinions of ourself. We, they're kind of the person that we wish we were or cultured and um, healthy and active and all of those sorts of things. But then we're also very bad at making plans for the future that are good for that future person. So in some ways, mm. yes, picking the healthy option for them is good. But when it comes to, for example, saving money for the future, it can be quite difficult for us to imagine what it will be like. And we kind of think that we'll be okay living on whatever it is we've put aside. But actually, when you stop and look at it, you realise that you're spending way more than that at the moment. And you kind of think that future you will be very different. And there were some quite cool experiments where they aged people's faces and got them to look mm. at their older self whilst making decisions for the future. And they found that they made kinder decisions towards that person when they could actually see them. So yeah, we have this, this kind of strange perspective on the future that can be a bit problematic. It does feel like we spend a lot of our time just trying to trick our brain, but <laughs> tricks of the brain they actually work. And we see that with things like the placebo effect and the and the nocebo effect. And if you could explain what both of those are and, and how they really show us the power of the human brain. Yeah. So the placebo effect is fascinating and the nocebo effect is the kind of opposite of it. So the placebo effect is people often, if they're given an inactive pill or injection or even sometimes an operation, they will feel better even though that pill or injection or operation has done absolutely nothing. The nocebo effect is the opposite. So that would be someone feeling worse, perhaps experiencing pain because they were expecting pain when actually there isn't any there. So um, you can see this if you give someone morphine, someone who's in pain morphine, but you don't tell them, they won't experience as much pain relief as if you tell them you're giving it to them. And if you tell them you've stopped the morphine, they'll say they feel more pain, even mm. if you haven't. So there's all these kind of weird effects. And there've been some, some really interesting studies that have found that it's not just about expectation. So even if a doctor tells you that what they're giving you is an inert pill that doesn't have any physiological effects, but some people with your condition have found it helpful, some people yeah. find it helpful. And we don't fully understand it when at a sort of greater level, but we do sort of understand it when it comes to pain. When we hurt ourselves, signals are sent from the site of the pain to our brain. And usually that's going up our spinal cord, so from our arm or leg or whatever, to the brain. But there's also a pathway that goes in the opposite direction. And that allows the brain to dial down the pain based on all sorts of different things like your environment, um, your stress levels, and also whether you're experiencing pain in other parts of your body. So generally, you'll only feel the most painful thing at a time, and you won't feel slight anything else until that most painful thing stops hurting so much. So we think that the placebo effect when it comes to pain is activating that descending pain control pathway somehow. And we know this because if you look in the brain of someone who is experiencing the placebo effect for pain, an area of the brain called the PAG, periaqueductal gray, which is involved in this descending pain control pathway is activated. So it seems to be involved in that. And this pathway uses our body's natural opioids. So those are natural chemicals that are related to morphine and heroin. And we have a bunch of different ones of them and they are natural painkillers. So our brains cause them to be released in the nerves of the spinal cord, in the nerves where the injury is, and also in the brain. And they have a whole host of different effects that add up to blocking 
that pain signal or dampening it down at least based on, as I say, all sorts of things, one of which is the placebo effect. It, it feels like ultimately all these things are so complicated and so <laughs> interconnected. And, and your book does a wonderful job but covering so many of the different chemicals that impact the brain. But the joke is the more we seem to understand about the brain, also the, the less we know. So really, your book is a story about how brain science itself progresses. So there's a real challenge there, isn't it, to write something about something as complicated as the human brain. Oh, totally. And I went through a process in each chapter where I sort of start off thinking that I knew some stuff about the topic. <laughs> and, then, and then I get part of the way through and be like, I know absolutely nothing. Mm. And then I sort of get to the point where I'm like, OK, we know absolutely nothing. No one knows that. Um, so I had to sort of pick out some stories and some bits and some things that we do know. And that's one of the reasons that I did some of the historical stuff, because I think it's really interesting seeing how our understanding has developed mm. and how many years it took to even discover that this neurotransmitter existed. So the fact that we now know it does all of these different things is really quite amazing. But yeah, there's a huge amount that we still don't know about the brain. And I think that our understanding of the brain in part is progressing kind of in parallel with technology that allows us to mm -hmm. explore it. And that's one of the reasons neuroscience is really quite a young field compared to sort of physics or chemistry. We haven't been doing it that long. And partly that's because we didn't have the technology to do it. Going back to microscopes, the first time a microscope was invented that was good enough to see neurons. And then we had to discover a stain that allowed them to kind of show up in colour under the microscope. And then you come more recently to the invention of the fMRI, the Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging Machine, which was the first time really that we were able to sort of look inside a functioning human brain and see which areas were active. And that led to a huge amount of research looking at the brain region that does this and the brain region that does that. But actually, as we've got better and better imaging equipment, we've started to realise that, oh, well, it's not just that region. It's a whole network of regions that are connected and are distributed throughout the brain. And now often we talk about the network for hunger or mm. pain or whatever, rather than the one tiny area. And I think... Yeah, I think it's technology as much as neuroscience that's kind of driving our understanding. And now we're with things like the Human Connectome Project mm. that's looking to map every connection in a human brain. We are starting to pick away at the, at the levels of complexity. But yeah, there's just a lot there to kind of unravel. It's, it's so clear that you're, you're wonderfully enthusiastic about science <laughs> and what science can teach us about the brain. But what about things like philosophy or psychotherapy, meditation, spirituality? Spirituality? Are there other ways perhaps we could find truths about the human brain? Yeah, well, I think a lot of the time when you push too far in neuroscience or psychology, mm. as we've been discussing, you do kind of tip over into philosophy. And neuroscience is the only science that has to use the thing it's studying in order to study it. We, we have to use our brains in order to study our brains. And that's kind of a weird thing to think about. And does that mean there's, there's going to be a limit to our understanding? Because we're only ever going to be able to understand it through our own limitations. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think there definitely is room for philosophy. And one of the things that I found in the book that I think we need more of is the neuroscientists and the psychologists and the philosophers all talking to each other and trying to connect up the dots. Because quite often, the people who are working on the molecular mechanisms don't always talk to the people who are working on the whole brain mechanisms, who don't always talk to the people who are working on the behaviour it produces. So trying to connect those dots, I think, is really interesting. There is, you mentioned meditation there, and there is some really interesting research that is starting to show that meditation can cause changes in the brain. And this has been a big area that has sort of moved from that kind of more I guess, only being part of kind of spiritual thing mm -hmm. into more mainstream culture as scientists have, have actually found benefits for it. And I actually do try to do a mindfulness practice every day because there are 
there is good evidence that it can help with um, managing stress. And if you're managing your stress, then that's likely to help keep you mentally healthy. There is evidence that it's good for sort of practicing focused attention. So basically the brain gets better at things that you practice. Mm. So mindfulness meditation is about trying to focus on just one thing, focus on the breath, or you can focus on uh, sound or kind of, there's various different things, but it's about focusing and not reacting to your thoughts and your emotions as they come up. And that kind of not reacting, not getting caught up in your emotions, that does seem to strengthen that ability to do that in day-to-day life. So you become, you might notice that you're feeling angry or sad, but you don't, it doesn't affect you quite as Mm -hmm. much. You're able to sort of disconnect and go, ah, I'm feeling this way. That is because of this and and not get swept up in it as much. So yeah, that kind of emotional non-reactivity does seem to be strengthened with um, meditation practices. Um, Obviously it's not a Mm cure-all and you can still get depression even if you spend your whole time meditating it's not a kind of if you do this you will definitely be well thing but there is some evidence that it can can help with the management of of those kinds of things in some people no, it's, it's fascinating with, with things like Vipassana meditation, how they teach you how to act equanimously to emotions, not look at them with craving or aversion, allowing them to pass over you, which mm. must have some fundamental impact on the, the chemistry of the brain, at least over a long, prolonged period of time. And, and it is, it's, it's so fascinating that the brain is, is one of those weird things that has the ability to study itself. I, I've often heard it <laughs> described that the brain is the only organ that named itself, which is quite a wonderful, yes. quite a wonderful <laughs> idea. But looking out into the future now and, and the exciting future studies that are coming just around the corner that are going to reveal so much more about the brain, is there anything that you're particularly excited about, excited about discovering about the human brain? Yeah, I think one of the things that became very clear to me in the book was, say, the fact that different chemicals have different effects in different parts of the brain and also based on different kind of receptors that they have there. So the idea that we might be able to produce brain medicines that are more targeted Mm. than the ones we have at the moment, I think is a really exciting idea for the future. It's a bit of a way off. We do already have targeted medicines for the body. It's most commonly used in cancer treatment rather than giving a drug that affects all the cells in your body and hoping that it knocks out the cancer ones without making you too sick. Some In some cancers, you can give a drug that specifically targets the tumour only and has m- many fewer side effects. So if we could find ways of doing that in the brain and only targeting the parts that need that drug... I think that could be game changing because it could produce the benefits without all of the side effects. And there's so many drugs that have been kind of left on the shelf because although they might produce benefits, the side effects they produce are too bad. So they just get ruled out. So if there were ways that we could target them, we could give lower doses and we could only dose whichever part of the brain is going wrong, that would be game changing. Of course, it means that we need to know which part of the brain Mm. is going wrong in that particular person. So there's sort of two halves of the puzzle. One is personalized medicine and one is targeted medicine. And you'd need them both to come together, I think, in the brain. But I think that could be could be really cool if we can do it. And it does feel like every brain is is different. And, and your book certainly has taught me how to better look after my own brain. And on that note, I just want to thank you <laughs> for being a guest on the Futures Podcast. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to Ginny for sharing the vital role our brain chemicals play in our lived experience. You can find out more by purchasing her new book, Overloaded, How Every Aspect of Your Life is Influenced by Your Brain Chemicals, available now. If you like what you've heard, then you can subscribe for our latest episode. Or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Futures Podcast. More episodes, transcripts, and show notes can be found at futurespodcast.net. Thank you for listening to the Futures Podcast.